Hi, and welcome to another presentation on the wonderful teaching of the Lord Jesus on the Kingdom of God. This is now part five, and this particular aspect that we want to deal with is um, probably the most challenging part of what Jesus has to say because he goes right to the very heart of an issue that affects every single one of us. Um, I've read through these chapters many times, as I'm sure you have as well. But I found that by going in detail and looking very carefully at what the Lord has to say uh, and thinking about it and prayerfully considering these words, I found them extremely challenging, but also very inspiring. So let's fasten our seatbelts as we allow the Lord to address a very, very sensitive issue in our lives. And let's take his counsel carefully and prayerfully. Um, as we uh, give our full and undivided attention to the greatest authority in the universe as he addresses these issues with us. So I'm going to now pop down into my little corner and let's have a look at the Word of God. Of course, we don't have pictures of the new earth, but I've chosen a picture of a beautiful garden just to try and give us a little bit of a, an impression and to open our hearts and our minds to what the Lord is really talking about, because his kingdom, while it is unseen at the moment, it will become very visible, very tangible, and very physical when it comes down onto the earth, because that is God's plan, is to bring heaven and earth together. And so this is what he's calling us into, to be part of his eternal, glorious, and magnificent kingdom. We're now going to have a look at Matthew chapter 6 and reading from verse 19, which I'll get to in a moment. But in this section, Jesus deals with the very thorny issue of money. This is a very, very delicate, controversial and difficult issue. But Jesus takes it head on and we need to look at a various, uh, various other scriptures about this so that we can get a full understanding of what the Word of God has to say about this very difficult and yet important issue of money. So what does money offer us? It obviously offers us security. It offers us peace of mind, if you have sufficient in the bank. It offers us the opportunity to enjoy the very best that this life has to offer. So as one looks at at money, and I'm sure that all of us at one point or another have had little um, daydreams about winning the lottery and how that would change our lives if suddenly we had millions in the bank. What would we do with it? And how easy and how pleasant our lives might become. But strangely, as one looks at the scriptures in so many different places, we find that the Bible um, is very anti money in some respects. And yet money is a necessity. So how do we understand this paradox and get to grips with what the scripture has to say and how do we approach this whole question of money? So let's look at what the Lord Jesus has to say about money. Then Jesus said to his disciples, Truly I tell you, it is hard for, a rich, for the rich to enter the kingdom of heaven. So Jesus says that riches are, or make it very difficult for us to enter the kingdom of heaven. Then he goes on to say, again, I'll tell you, it is easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than for the rich to enter the kingdom of God. Uh, how can we reconcile this? Because in the world, everything is driving towards having money. Money gives us status. Money gives, buys us friends. Money gives us access to the best medical facilities. Uh, money provides us with so much. So why would the Lord Jesus say that it is hard for a rich man to enter into the kingdom of heaven? Um, Jesus went on and he dictated a letter to the churches in the book of Revelation. And he said, you say, I am rich. I have acquired wealth and do not need a thing. But you do not realize that actually you are wretched, pitiful, poor, blind, and naked. 
So Jesus is warning us about the fact that having wealth can make us look as if everything is fine. But deep down inside, we are spiritually poor. And that's what he's warning us about. Then the scripture further goes on to tell us, those who want to get rich fall into temptation and a trap and into many foolish and harmful desires that plunge people into ruin and destruction. Paul goes on as he writes to Timothy and he says, For the love of money is a root of all kinds of evil. Some people, eager for money, have wandered from the faith and pissed themselves with many griefs. Um, we only have to look at the world around about us to see that the love of money is indeed the root of all evil. All corruption, uh, armed robberies, murders, greed, um, the condition of men's hearts uh, because of the love of money is very, very evident around about us. So the command in the book of Hebrews is, Keep your lives free from the love of money and be content with what you have. Because God has said, never will I leave you, never will I forsake you. So there is a very, very important aspect that we need to consider. But the problem is, we need money. Money is a necessity. So how do we deal with the fact that we need money and that we have to work in order to obtain money and yet we're finding that the scripture speaks uh, so negatively about being rich um, we also have to consider the fact that there are rich people in in the bible uh, job for instance was a very rich man abraham was very rich king solomon was extremely rich so there are rich people in the scriptures so riches in themselves are not wrong. It's not wrong to be rich. Money in itself is not wrong, but it, it's what it does to us. It's what how it uh, changes our perception and deceives us. That's the big problem with money. If we just stop for a moment and think how much time and energy and effort and planning goes into our lives to make money, how much of our time is spent uh, trying desperately to get more and more money because money is a necessity. We have to pay the rent. We have to provide food. There are things that we need. Uh, and so we're constantly striving for money. There's, there's labor that is involved. My sister-in-law tells a story of a colleague of hers, a man that worked with her, his whole life's desire and mission and dream was to sail around the world with his wife in his yacht. And so every bit of spare time he spent building up this beautiful yacht in readiness so that when he retired, he'd sail around the world. And of course, the time came when he was able to retire and he and his wife then set off in this yacht uh, across to America. They made it to America but once they got there, unfortunately, she developed cancer and then eventually died. So his dream uh, that he'd worked for his whole life and that they'd been looking forward to came to a dismal end as she passed away. But not giving up on his dream, this man continued <clears throat> uh, in America, uh, preparing himself to once again sail around the world met another lady who was willing to sail with him. He married her. So now he has his second wife and he set off in his yacht. And as they were traveling down the coast of Africa, um, just uh, near to Angola, they were sleeping in their yacht and they didn't realize that they had drifted into the shipping lane and they collided with a great big tanker and their yacht sank. Uh, fortunately, the, their lives were saved but their dream is now lying at the bottom of the Atlantic Ocean. So <clears throat> when one looks at all the effort that we put in to accumulate wealth and accumulate material things, um, it, it is so fragile. Life is so fragile. There are so many things that we have no control over that 
to put our confidence and our trust in material things is really what the scripture is dealing with and this is not not wise uh, and it le could leave us very very empty let us now look to what jesus has to say in matthew chapter 6 verse 19 and this is the continuation of the sermon on the mount he says do not store up for yourselves treasures on earth where moth and rust destroy and where thieves break in and steal. But store up for yourselves treasures in heaven where moth and rust do not destroy and where thieves do not break in and steal. For where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. Jesus here is really changing our paradigm. This is a drastic change in our approach to the whole question of money. And he says that we must look beyond our goals of trying to achieve a certain standing uh, of wealth and a certain standing in this life, materialistically speaking. We've got to look beyond because now we are part of the eternal kingdom. We've already entered into this kingdom because we've been born again. So now we're part of his eternal kingdom and so how our values need to change, our attitude needs to change, and our whole worldview and perspective needs to change, and particularly with regard to money. So that's what he's saying. We must now lay up for ourselves treasures in heaven or treasures in the new kingdom, his kingdom, the heavenly kingdom, and not on earth. Because as he says, moth and rust uh, can uh, destroy and thieves can break in and steal as we know only too well so we could lose everything that we have materially unless our treasure is actually vested in the kingdom of heaven and then of course he says where your treasure is that's where your heart will be also so that's very much like saying if your house is on fire what will you grab because whatever you grab will indicate what is most important to you. So he's saying where your treasure is, that's where your heart will be also. So the way to deal with material things in this life is to fix our focus upon the eternal inheritance. Now I want to speak a little bit more about that and we'll, we'll have an, a look at another scripture. But let's just read on a little further. He says, the eye is the lamp of the body. If your eyes are healthy, your whole body will be full of light. But if your eyes are unhealthy, your whole body will be full of darkness. And if then the light within you is darkness, how great is that darkness? So he says, we need to have a singleness of purpose. Um, we mustn't be distracted, but our focus needs to be on that eternal inheritance. Let's just put it this way. In this life, if one as a young person were to go to a financial advisor, the question that they would generally ask is, where would you like to be in 10 years from now? And so you might say, well, I'd like to own a house. I'd like to have sufficient money in the bank and, um, and have a nice motor car. So then the financial advisor will say, in that case, we need to look at how you will achieve that goal. So the goal is to arrive at your your dream in 10 years time but you need the steps to get there so you might need more education you might need to expand your business whatever it is to arrive at your goal but jesus is saying no let's set our goal in the eternal kingdom where moth and rust does not uh, corrupt and where thieves can't break in and steal and where our whole focus is single because if our eye is single, our purpose is single, then nothing is going to distract us. And then Jesus finally pulls out the big guns and he goes for the punchline and he doesn't pull his punches. He says, no one can serve two masters. What is he talking about? Either you will hate the one and love the other or you will be devoted to the one and despise the other. And then here it comes. You cannot serve both God and money. So that's where he's saying we have to need, we need a singleness of purpose. We cannot serve God and money. 
problem is money is a necessity in this life. So we need money, but he says we can't serve God and money. So how do we understand this distinction and how do we divide between these two and make sure that we're serving God and not money? To understand this principle, let's go back to the Garden of Eden. We know that God wanted man to have dominion over the creation, but he would have to do this in partnership with God. So it was going to be a wonderful uh, partnership between God and man, supervising the whole of creation and exploiting the magnificent potential that God had made in this lovely creation of earth and the material things and the beauty of it all around about. Um, so man would have to be very wise in making his decisions because there would be people that would be born because he was told to be fruitful and multiply so that the earth's population would increase. And so ruling over this population would require a very clear knowledge of good and evil. What is the good thing to do and what is the evil thing to shun as he ruled and reigned over God's creation? Now, of course, as you know, there was this tree of the knowledge of good and evil. And God said, you're not to partake of that tree, because if you do, then you will die. The serpent had other ideas, as we, as we well know. And so he presented Eve with this possibility. He said, the tree is to be desired to make one wise. Then the serpent said, God knows that if you eat of this tree, you will be like God. So while the eating of the tree was in, disobedient, in disobedience to God's direct command, what it really did was it caused Adam and Eve to go in an independent direction where they now had the knowledge of good and evil. God actually confirms this by saying, now that the man has become like us to know good and evil, in other words, like God, we'll put him out of the garden. So Adam and Eve gained their independence from God by eating of the tree of the knowledge of, of good and evil. And here is the crux of the whole matter, is that when we get money and when we seek after money and we have the love of money, it is to become independent. It gives us a certain amount of independence. But let's just go back to our scripture. So what I'm saying is that money gives us independence. You know, we often speak about being financially independent is a wonderful thing to be. But here is exactly what happens. If we've got money, we don't necessarily have to trust God because we can just go out and buy whatever we need. Um, so if we want to travel, we will travel because we have the money to do it. If we need a new motor car, we go out and buy a new motor car. If we need medical attention, well, money can buy the best medical attention. So here is where we can put our confidence in money and find our independence in money rather than finding our dependence on God. So this is what Jesus is saying. We should have our eyes single and focus on God as our provider. And if God provides us with money, that's good and well, and he will. But our confidence and our trust is in the Lord. So whatever we need in this life, we know that God will supply because we're really our pilgrims passing through. We're not part of this world. We're in it, but we're not part of it. Our focus is on the world to come and the kingdom to come. So again, let's say this. Money in this life is a necessity. So what is our attitude towards working? And so Paul deals with this, and this is a mind-blowing and life-changing perspective that Paul gives to us. So let's have a look at it. Colossians chapter 3. He says, Whatever you do, work at it with all of your heart as working for the Lord not for human masters, since you know that you will receive an inheritance from the Lord as a reward. It is the Lord Christ you are serving. 
Now let's stop for a moment and consider this verse very carefully. Whatever you do. I think that what we often do is we make a distinction between the Lord's work and secular work. So the Lord's work is what we do for the Lord. If we're witnessing to someone, if we are uh, preaching, if we are um, participating in meetings, if we're reading our Bible, praying, having our quiet time, that's the Lord's work. But then when I go to work, that's my secular work. Or if I'm cleaning the house, making food, uh, teaching children, whatever I might be doing, that is secular work. And we make that distinction. But Paul is saying, no, whatever we do, we do it heartily as unto the Lord. We actually are serving the Lord. So here is the dividing line. When you get saved, when you are born again, you are stepping over the line from this material world into the kingdom of God's dear son. So we're now part of the kingdom. And so whatever we do, whether we are a school teacher teaching children, whether we are manufacturing something, whether we are construct, uh, in construction, uh, whether we, whatever we're doing, if we're providing a service, if we have a business, um, if we are professional people, whatever we might be doing, Paul says, you actually are now working for the Lord. This is a, a very far-reaching and dynamic um, concept that Paul is presenting to us. He is saying that we're not serving human masters, we're actually serving the Lord. And then this is what he says. Because you know that you will receive an inheritance. Now, that's not as if someone is going to die and we'll suddenly receive a lot of money. That's how we think of inheritance. But what he's really referring to here is a reference back to the Old Testament where the children of Israel were going through the wilderness and they were looking forward to receiving their inheritance in the promised land. And that was a piece of real estate in the promised land. And this is what the Lord is offering to us. He, Jesus said, in my father's house, there are many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you. And I'm going to prepare a place for you. So we have a piece of real estate as an inheritance in the new earth, in the, in the new kingdom of God. It's very real, very tangible, very material, but it is yet future. And this is what he's saying. So... Whatever we might be doing, we're actually working for the Lord, knowing that we're going to receive an inheritance in the new kingdom of God. And this is our reward, because as he says, it is the Lord Christ you are serving. So this changes our whole perspective on why we are working and doing what we're doing. We're not doing it for the money. We're doing it for the Lord, recognizing that we have a part in his kingdom. Now, of course, the money will come, and, but we'll recognize that not as the goal, but rather as the provision, a means to an end, which God will provide for us. So our heavenly father is our provider. And that's the difference that Jesus is talking about. James also has some comforting words about this. And he says, Listen, my dear brothers and sisters, has not God chosen those who are poor in the eyes of the world to be rich in faith and to inherit the kingdom he promised those who love him? So having given us the gut punch, the Lord Jesus, concerning money, so he says we can't serve God and money. We've got to choose. Having said all of that, he now goes on and he says, Therefore I tell you, do not worry. Uh, um, this, is, this is very comforting and very wonderful. He said, you don't have to worry about money. You're part of a kingdom. You now have a heavenly father who cares for you. So he says, do not worry about your life, what you will eat or drink. So he's talking about the practical things or about your body, what you will wear. Is not life more important than food and the body more important than clothes? Then he turns us to the creation. And he says, Look at the birds of the air. They do not sow or reap or store away in barns, and yet your heavenly Father feeds them. 
Are you not much more valuable than they? Can any one of you, by worrying, add a single hour to your life? And why do you worry about clothes? See how the flowers of the field grow. They do not labor or spin, yet I tell you that not even Solomon in all his splendor was dressed like one of these. If that is how God clothes the grass of the field, which is here today and tomorrow is thrown into the fire, will he not much more clothe you? Then here is another punchline. He says, if we are warring, we are of little faith. Now think about this for a moment. Where does stress and worry and all the uh, consequential illnesses come from in this life? Stress, worry, depression, anxiety and sickness. Much of it comes from worrying about money. And this is what Jesus is saying. So what Jesus is saying is the antidote to worry is to have faith. Put your confidence in your heavenly father. He then goes on to tell us again. So do not worry saying, what shall we eat? What shall we drink? What shall we wear? For the pagans, the heathen run after all these things and your heavenly father knows that you need them. And then of course, the famous saying, but seek First, his kingdom. Now, that's what he's been explaining in Matthew 5 and 6 that we've been going through. This is the kingdom. He says we must seek after. We must seek after these values. Seek after a lifestyle because now we're part of this kingdom. Seek first his kingdom and his righteousness. These values, these ethics, these high standards that Jesus is setting, we need to seek after those. And then he says, and all these things will be given to you as well. Therefore, do not worry for a third time now he's saying it about tomorrow. For tomorrow will worry about itself. Each day has enough trouble of its own. Our heavenly father knows that we have need of money. He knows how much money we need. He knows when we need it. And many of us can testify that our Heavenly Father is a wonderful provider and we can put our absolute confidence in Him and not con be concerned about money or have our focus upon money because our Heavenly Father uh, really loves us and He cares for us in the most magnificent way. So let's get back to our vision of the new earth and focus our attention on what the Lord is offering to us. We have an inheritance in the kingdom of God, in the new heavens and the new earth. And what a wonderful thing that will be. And as Jesus said right at the very beginning, blessed are the poor in spirit, for yours is the kingdom of God.